You've reached Hotel Pacifico, your five-star destination for BC Politicos. Press 4 for room service. Press the star key for your hosts, Mike McDonald and Kate Hammer. Welcome back, guests of Hotel Pacifico. We have a great episode here today. But first, we want to welcome back one of our our fellow colleagues, Kate, who abandoned us last week to conduct her civic duty in a jury. Kate, exactly. thanks for coming back. Thanks for dealing dealing with a expeditious verdict. Oh, well, I don't know if it's called expeditious. It was it didn't feel expeditious, but I'm glad to be here. Justice was done. Justice mm-hmm. was done. Excellent. Well, without further ado, we'd like to introduce our special guest today, the 31st Premier of British Columbia, Glenn Clark, all the way from East Vancouver. Glenn, welcome to Hotel Pacifico. Thanks. Nice to be here. And uh, we are finding you at home today. Are you all ready for Christmas? You got the tree decorated and all the presents, <laughs> the tree, all your shopping done? The tree is decorated. No, the shopping's not done, but uh, I'm, I love, I'm home. I love the moody trees behind you, the artwork behind that's, you. That's a, that's a BC artist. Uh, and I had that commissioned for me, but it's kind of fading with the sun. You know, so much sun in it. Uh, Who was yeah. the artist? I can't remember. <laughs> I <have a> <laughs> He's from British his, Columbia. I have a couple of his works. Yeah, it's well, all you're growth, of... right? It's all <laughs> growth, Glenn. If, I, I'm sure it's all growth. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> is there? Is it actually like a particular area in BC? Is it? No, um, no, no it's, it's just a general. Yeah, yeah. Just fantastic. Old BC yeah. trees. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for joining us today, and uh, we, we're going to love picking your brain on what you've been doing and what you're thinking about and how you see British Columbia with all your uh, accumulated experience over the years. That's a way of trying not to make you sound old, but uh, <laughs> but you're, you you no, <laughs> you spent uh, over 20 years, I think, at Patterson Group. You recently left Patterson Group as. Um, I don't know if retiring is the right word for you, but what you know, what are you what are you up to now? There was a friend of mine who was the CEO of Loblaws, or kind of a friend, a colleague that he um, he left Loblaws and he said he's going plural, and I thought that was a weird thing to say, but actually I kind of relate to that now. So I have about five uh, gigs, I guess. I'm on the board of Canfor still. I'm on the board of West Shore Terminals, both courtesy of the of the controlling shareholder, which is Jim Pattison, and I'm on the board of a startup called Tursa. Right. Uh, Earth. And then I'm on, I'm on two retainers, one from uh, Rogers Communications and one from um, a company called Tiny Capital over in Vancouver Island. So it's a, a tech conglomerate. And I'm really enjoying it. Actually, it's quite interesting. Oh, the going, going plural. I like that. I can see myself using that again, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. It's interesting. It's interesting, Glenn, because I I was reflecting. I mean, you've had by any measure a fascinating career. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you a bit about is there's a bit of a flip you've managed, right? In politics, there's a lot. I can think of a few examples of the person who built a career in business and rose to the top, and then right. leveraged that to kind of come in as a star candidate to politics. And you you flipped that paybook. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about. Um, you know, what you think, uh, what you think about pol- politics prepared you for the business yeah. world? Yeah, there's not many of us. In fact, I can't name another one, actually. Maybe maybe yeah. a guy named uh, Trevor Harding, who was the Minister of Energy for the NDP in Yukon. He's, okay. he's carved out a, a pretty good business career. Um, well, uh, you know, I got a, I got elected at 28. I think I won the nomination at 27. And then I was there for 15 years. So when I, by the time I, uh, I was a has been in politics, I, um, I was still only 40 ish. Right. So I, and I needed to work at a mortgage. So in that respect, uh, it's not that weird, right. Cause I had to get a, I had to get a job and I had no offers except for one. So that, that sort of solved that issue for me. Um, but you know, politics, it's all kind of the same. It's in, in some respects, it's all about, uh, people. It's all about relationship, leadership, people. Uh, yes. I always say, you know, there's a, there was a good TED talk a while back that I really kind of related to. There's kind of two currencies, right? There's relationship currency and there's competency currency. And there's people who are competent and uh, and can do very well, but without the relationship currency, without investing in relationships and people, 
Uh, they don't usually do that well. And similarly, you can't be all relationships and not and not have competence as well. So mm -hmm. the, in, in politics, especially in government, you're really managing a big enterprise and you're really trying hard to present a vision of where you want to go or where your ministry wants to go or where the province wants to go. And in, in, in business, particularly at a senior level, um, there's a lot of that same kind of, uh, of challenges, right? What, what, what's the goal here? What's the objective? How can we get everybody working together to, to achieve a common uh, goal? In, in the case of business, it's a little easier than politics because uh -huh. in, in business, it's um it's simpler in the way that you know you have to make money um there's no you know you, there's no real option <laughs> it's sort of either and in many respects that means you know cutting costs or or raising revenue uh, or both and um and so the objectives are really clear and simple and manageable it doesn't it doesn't make it easy but it but the the goals are clear in politics there's often multiple goals and and no clear answer uh, and no clear um, solution, and so so each thing becomes fuzzier and ch more challenging and more complicated than than in the in the business world. Can we can we can we linger where you started though? Because I was fascinated yeah. that you started with relationships. Yeah, and and I and I have this. I want to test it. Um, feel free to tear it down because I have sure. this working theory. <laughs> I have this working theory that this model we often see where people, where folks come from business and leverage that into sort of often kind of moving into a pretty powerful position, you know, in federal cabinet roles as a premier, as president of the United States. Um, and one of the things I noticed in observing some of those candidates is they're used to coming from a place where leadership comes with authority. Mm -hmm. And then they have to manage this role where there actually isn't authority. They're, they have to lead without authority. And I think that's much more challenging. Does that? Yeah, does that, I, I, yeah. that's fair. I, and I think it, I also would say that there aren't very many business people that are successful actually in politics. Um, mm -hmm. There's some. I'm, Brian Mulroney is probably the best example of someone mm -hmm. who was a business success and then came into politics but but he was a political creature to begin with right? exactly and there's lots of yeah. there's lots of business people who think it's easy in politics and it's way harder yeah. in in, mm -hmm. in in political life and so they usually fail in my experience uh, or don't yeah. do as well as as you think um so but but a humble um business leader or someone who really has learned um how to listen to people and how to lead through collaborative methods, I think um, has a better has a better chance in 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 politics. But you're right; it's a it's a it's a different skill set. But there just there just is some overlap, and I think the overlap is is really about how you how you manage to lead a group of people. And every you know every leader is different. In the Jim Pattis group, you know they have twenty odd companies. Most of the companies reported to me, and the presence of those companies. It's fascinating, right? They're all very different people, right? There's mm. really quiet, introverted uh, accountants, and then there's really boisterous uh, salespeople, and, and they're all successful, or they wouldn't be there, and they're all successful using sort of different management and leadership techniques, and the same is true in, in politics, of course. But I don't know, for me, uh, it really does revolve around how you get along with people, you know? I, one of the things, I learned a lot from Jimmy that in that respect. Glenn, I can't resist. You and I worked together for years. I, I cherish those memories. But I have to say that you <laughs> won an election, a close call on, on a very polarizing campaign, which made you very few friends in the business community. And you were termed a class warrior. And, uh, and, and, and I, don't I don't recall a lot of, uh, of calls from business leaders saying, I'd love to get together with the premier and just talk things <laughs> over. It was mostly, I'd love to see that guy out of business. But how did that work out for you? How do you feel about class in well, electoral politics these days? Oh, that's everything. I mean, that's the only thing that matters, really. Mm. I um, but it's not you know necessarily it's your position on class issues that's more important than your class, I guess. Um, I um, it's true. I mean, Jimmy is the only one that hired me, and uh, he didn't hire me at a senior level. He hired me at a pretty junior level. And the nice thing about the Jim Patterson Group, unlike some bigger businesses, I'd say, and even smaller ones in some respects, is that um, it's a real meritocracy. I mean, Jimmy really doesn't care um, if you're um, uh, a minority or a woman or or whatever. He, he just, it's all about results. And so the nice thing about working for Jimmy is, 
uh, if you do well, you get promoted. <laughs> if you keep doing well, you keep getting promoted. And, and, and so the business has cultivated a, a meritocracy that, that the likes of which, are, you know, you rarely see. I know it sounds weird because, in, you know, everybody has all these theories about business and they're all meritocracies in some respects, but they're not really. There's very political uh, businesses. And um, mm-hmm. so when I got when I was there, you're right, I didn't have any support in, in the business community. And I didn't really care about that because for me, politics is all about um, uh, I always like to see things through sort of a working class lens. And that all I really care about and always cared about was uh, working people. And, uh, and uh, you know, and I always have this view, you know, government doesn't need business, doesn't need government. Uh, rich people don't need government. It's government's for everybody else. And so, I mean, that's just my perspective. It's always been my perspective, still my perspective. And so I, I, um, so I didn't really care uh, that the business community weren't weren't all that supportive of me. In fact, I kind of appreciated that they didn't support me. Um, but when you're in business, um, and the nice thing about working for Jimmy, luckily, is um, you know it gives you some credibility in the business community, and it gives you. Uh, and then as you move up in the in in the world, you know, I was vi- I was a manager, then a vice president, then a president, then multiple presidencies, and then executive vice president of the Jim Patterson group and then president and chief operating officer, you know, then I think at some point the business community go, Oh, well, I guess he must be. Okay. Yeah, I certainly <laughs> heard that. But can I just do a quick follow-up, but you were a populist uh, mm-hmm. and that's a dirty word these days. And we want to talk a bit about the present, of course, do you think populism is a dirty word? Does it refer to uh, bad ideas that should not be given the time of day, or is it something that's in a positive dynamic? It's positive. I'm, I'm definitely a populist. It has, you know, obviously it's become uh, a dirty word with respect to, um, you know, Donald Trump and right wingers around the world. So it can be, it can be a force, I guess, for good or evil. But yeah, uh, it's a different time, of course. Um, now and uh you know there, there's a sort of infantilization of politics i think a kind of a, a caricature almost of of political debate and so that does lend itself to sort of certain i think simplistic demagoguery which you know in some respects could be populist but no i think um i think that um one of the reasons we have a right-wing populist kind of movement is because the mainstream, if you will, or the broad consensus uh, has failed uh, so many working people. I mean, it's failed people. And you just have to look around. I mean, it's always puzzling to me. You look at housing or some of these other spectacular market failures that have just done a, you know, capitalism in that respect has done a disservice to working people. And uh, it's, it's a bit always a surprise to me that the, the solution for many people uh, of a failed uh, uh, market failure is uh, more market, <laughs> more capitalism. And and yet it's been a spectacular failure. And you see that in, in lots of areas. And so, you know, the role of government surely is to address those market failures, is to respond to those it, it places where the market system doesn't work very well. And, uh, and I think it hasn't done that in lots of cases. And so people um, are naturally frustrated and angry by the by the conventional, if you will, modern consensus. And when I say modern consensus, it's been kind of this, there's a, certainly a left and right, but it's such a narrow band that, um, that people have felt left out. And, uh, that, and that's easy, not easy pickings, but that's uh, certainly a grist for the fire of a Donald Trump or even a Pierre Polyev, you know, who, who, who kind of um, can, can get it, can get some traction from those people because what they're saying about the system has, as always with any good politician and particularly good populist uh, and also uh, is, is, is that um, there's a grain of truth to it, right? Is the system rigged? Well, in some respects it is rigged in, in, is the, is the, you know, uh, the consensus uh, that's good for business and good in the aggregate, good for me personally, maybe, well, maybe not, you know, it's free trade. It's a good example of that. Is free trade um, objectively good for an open economy like Canada? Probably yes. It's, 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 has it generated income in Canada broadly? Yes. 
but is it distributed in a way that um, has enhanced the lives of of all people? The answer to that is clearly no. John Horgan called calls himself a populist. Yeah. Do you call David Eby a populist? Um, that's a good question. You know, he's a good politician, and uh, so in that respect, he's quite uh, he's quite adept at um, at reacting to issues. What what I like about David a lot is. He's actually a doer, right? Like, you know, there's so many people get into politics. I always wonder why are they there? In fact, people used yeah. to always come to see me. They still, people still come to see me and ask about political advice. And in fact, they ask even from all parties. Sometimes they come and ask yeah. me my view. And I always ask them the first question they ask if they're interested in politics. This is, well, why do you want to run? Mm -hmm. And it, it is shocking how many people can't oh. really answer that question. Mm -hmm. And even today, people who are elected, there's lots of people who are elected, and they're all, I mean, really all good people. There's no, this in Canada, in my experience, there's no, no sort of really mm -hmm. awful people uh, um, elected. But they don't really, they just want to be nice people, or they want to do good things or something. But the problem is, um, in the system is so stultifying, it's so bureaucratic, it's so status quo oriented that in order to do something, you really have to want to do it. You have to make change. And so of left or right, it doesn't matter. And uh, I think what I really like about David Eby is he's not afraid to make change. I don't always agree with him, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe some, maybe more often than not, I don't. But but I like that he's an, a man of action, a doer, someone who wants to actually mm -hmm. do something. And so I don't know if that's a populist, but he does react. He is uh, reactive to uh, to the popular will in a way that I think uh, is very healthy. Well, there's a, a guy I know who uh, wrote a book about Dave Barrett and the Barrett yeah. years. Um, what was his name, Kate? Mickleboro. Uh, yeah. Rod Mickleboro. Uh, Rod Mickleboro. Oh, yeah. Meth, meth, meth Jags, something like that. Meth Jags. Uh, oh, Jeff. 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 Anyways. Thanks. We talked a lot about that in recent episodes about the Barrett years. Did, were you kind of a, I mean, when you came to power in 1991 as finance minister, uh, were you think were you inspired by Dave Barrett's approach uh, in yeah, terms absolutely. of absolutely, taking, yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody's different. Uh, the current government's probably clearly quite different from from when I was there, uh, and we were quite different from the Dave Barrett government. And circumstances are different, right? But um, right. But certainly inspired by by Dave, and there was a good example of someone who came to office in three and a half years and had made more change and more lasting change than mm -hmm. than we've seen really in in many places. But there are other examples across Can Canada as well. I mean, I think the René Lévesque government and others have made huge changes um, to the to the to the culture. And actually, on, on a more more conservative note, uh, Brian Mulroney, Brian, Brian yeah. Mulroney had more impact on Canada than than than. I can't think of a pri prime minister, certainly in the recent past, recent being the last mm -hmm. I don't know, 50 years or 100 years, that had more impact on the Canada. You think about it, free trade, yeah. um, the GST, mm -hmm. um, uh, sanctions Mitchell. against South, uh, South, uh, South Africa, yeah. uh, acid rain treaty. I mean, these are yeah. These were big initiatives mm -hmm. that were pursued. And then he tried mm -hmm. to bring home the Constitution. Yeah. Or repatriated, I mean, if it needed repatriating, and he and he ultimately failed in that. But these were not small initiatives. All every one of them were big, big, big changes, and it's super impressive when you look back on it in history. So, I mean, it's it's not a unique to a, to a right or left wing government. It's just that what I like, I like the fact of politicians who want to make change because so much change is needed, in my view. Uh, if you want to pursue social justice in any meaningful way. Do you look at, I mean, do you ever have like, what is it like premiership FOMO? I'm going to call it like, <laughs> like, and, and I'm thinking of it in the vein too, because you were premier in the nineties and the context was so different. Yeah. Right. And some of those leaders well, were, yeah. yeah. Only slightly, slightly Kate. I, I, I will say that slightly because, um, you know, we, <laughs> Uh, you know, we had a deficit. We came in with a big deficit, the government, we inherited a big deficit. We had to try to fix that. And the times were such that people were demanding, or business community in particular, were demanding change in that respect. And so we had to make change without any money. Mm. And uh, and that was a much more challenging prospect 
the current and no, no disrespect to John Horgan, he got elected and the government for some foolish reason left this massive multi-billion dollar surplus, <laughs> which they've uh, proceeded to spend. No, go on, yeah. go on. It's one of my please, observations. More, more, yes. please, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is a gas, right? I mean, they've done, and, and I'm not- What a know. magnanimous government that left all that- uh, <laughs> Yeah, how, how stupid- balance, Strong balance uh, sheet. Well, I think worse than that, they, the worst thing is they left it and I don't think they realized they'd left it. Like, I don't think I'm, they realize it was you're tri I'm triggered. No, um. me too. I'm from, I'm, I'm from Ontario, Glenn, and I, I have the same. I I rolled up for my first budget, and I was like, what? What? What is happening? Well, <laughs> well yes, John Horgan inherited a strong balance sheet. Yes, this yes, is true. <laughs> <laughs> but he also, I would argue that the other thing that happened under Horgan was COVID, and the paradigm shifted in terms of, like, balance budgets were yes. a big deal in the 90s and all the way through it was kind of a defining principle of the Campbell mm -hmm. Christie Clark years it was kind of a real uh, unifying principle for the BC liberals and and I would argue that the reason we ended up with such a big surplus is because everyone was just like so committed to being frugal that yeah. uh you know kind of lost the plot a little bit there but uh, but now it's a little uh, bit about... <laughs> <laughs> completely <laughs> lost the plot. But well, it's, it's typical. We Mike get of... very excited about debt GDP ratios. <laughs> it's, but, typical um... of, it's typical, Mike, of of right wing governments like you. You're you're supported, and support um, the right wing governments. Uh, it's easier to govern when you have that kind of simple mechanism. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to balance the budget. We have to cut. Oh, we have to cut welfare rates. It's not nothing personal. We have to balance the budgets a priority. We have to not spend on transit because balancing budgets priority. We have to not spend on on anything to do with social justice because we have to balance the budget. That's the it's the oh, oh by the way let's cut taxes, but then we have to balance the budget because we don't have no we don't have any tax revenue anymore. So we better we better cut spending more. And so that is that's the cycle that all right wing governments are in and. I know you're a big supporter of that, Mike, but uh, I'm not. Well, <laughs> uh, I think you meant centrist, but um, centrist. <laughs> but there are there are lots Christy of examples. Think Christie Clark's a centrist? There are lots of examples. Give me a break. Of, well, what about Roy Romano? We you think Christie Clark's a centrist? Really? Well, I'm, I'm going to get centrist? some popcorn for this. I'm just well, I, <laughs> no, but seriously, I sat in the legislature. I, I don't think balancing the but I don't think balancing the budget is necessarily right or left thing. You know, well, it is when you there's use a lot it of just when it is when you use it to justify not supporting working people. It is when you use it to justify not raising welfare rates, not raising minimum wage for like a hundred years. You know, it, you every time it's used as a cudgel against anything you want mm -hmm. to do progressive, and so that's why it's not right wing in itself. You're correct. Well, I I think one of the realities that's happened it was certainly starting to happen during your time in government, and certainly has got. Uh, more pronounced over the last 20 years is that healthcare has eaten government yeah. and it's become a huge percentage of, and I, you know, I think in the Campbell years, I think one of the um, defining characteristics was healthcare going up, mm -hmm. healthcare spending going up at the expense of pretty well right. every other ministry in government, except education was flat, I think. And, and, you know, forestry, right. all the dirt ministries, everything got ground into uh you know, negative, um, negative growth and spending. So I think that's part of the reality too. Right. And that's, yeah. that's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge, but it's also a choice, right? Governing, governing is a choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so who cares of health budgets going up? Well, maybe you have to raise taxes, Mike. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, well, that's a choice. Wrong, yeah. What's wrong with that? Like, like we need healthcare for, for people who mm -hmm. can't afford it. It's a classic case of market failure. We talked mm -hmm. about earlier. Uh, healthcare mm -hmm. is a big problem and it probably needs more resources. Well, and it, you know, this is the thing. If you don't provide more resources, if we don't deal with healthcare in a fundamental way, then you open the door to privatization. I know that's what you want, Mike, because you support right-wing governments. Well, you you understood the importance <laughs> of uh, of affordability though, because I mean, you under your yeah. premiership, you were yeah. talking about freezing rates yeah. and, right. you know, so what, why should costs my down. So why should my taxes be the same basically as you know as a longshoreman or a or a mechanics taxes i mean what i mean i don't i just don't i just don't get it right like why but, but they're, why not, they're not they, they they climb yeah yeah i just mean but, generally speaking. but let's talk about a tax that yeah. we've had different views on uh mm -hmm. and that's the carbon tax 
So, uh, you know, a market failure for sure to curb the impacts of emissions on the global climate and yeah. a carbon tax brought in after your time because yeah. climate change wasn't really an issue in your premier, supported by Gordon Campbell, opposed at the time by Carol James, now right. supported by John Horgan and David Eby. What do you think the carbon tax's uh, future is? Does it have one? No, I don't think so. I think it's the uh, because it's, look at why do they want to solve uh, people always want to solve these problems on the back of working people again. Like, I'm serious. Like when we decided, you know, we didn't want lead in gasolines, we didn't tax lead. We eliminated it. When we decided, when the world decided we didn't want DDT, we didn't tax it. We got rid of it. So the tax thing is a lazy attempt by politicians to raise revenue and provide a social virtue signaling or something. But it's a punitive, it's tough. It's a tough tax on people. And it's a, ta it's a tax. I know they give, there's all these, we give tax rebates for, you know, for low income people, et cetera. But I just about fundamentally think we clearly have an issue. I get, let me, if you want to solve um, uh, global warming, which is a clearly something we want to solve, then make transit free and triple the transit budget. Like, 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 like get serious about, about global warming. Instead, we just tax people because let, let's put it another way. Let's say you wanted to the carbon, you want the carbon tax to work, make it a dollar a gallon. Well, then it'll work. But instead, we raise it a little tiny bit, raise a bunch of money, hurts people, or at least people see it and they, and they pay it. And it doesn't solve the problem, hasn't, doesn't restrict things. And then, by the way, the same politicians who raised the carbon tax, including the Gordon Campbell government, uh, for market reasons, the price of oil went up. And they went, they had, oh, my goodness, we have an inquiry into oil pricing. What's happening? They're gouging us. They should have been applauding the price. The price of oil is going up. Yay. Uh, that's, that's, that's fantastic. That's what they want. So they just, it's really a signal on, on carbon, which is obviously a huge problem for the world, maybe the number one problem in the world. But it doesn't solve the problem. And I don't see the, the action to try to actually uh, help people get off. So try to, why don't we try to help people deal with global warming rather than just punish them for driving a truck? So that's, like, such, a, that's such an interesting take. And I, I, I'm i just trying to think through like if, you, if my kind of, if I look confused, I'm actually trying to think through like to your point about like a DDT, right? Like it's like, just get rid of it. Like we've got to like, if, you, if it's not good, just get rid of it. And you're kind of point and you're totally fair criticism that it's really kind of hurting working folks, right? To, to make, to, to make this transition. Well, if you take the DDT approach and we were to sort of say, okay, like wipe it out, you're still going to be really hurting the same folks and perhaps more profoundly so because just of all the knock-on effects of all the ways fossil fuels are within our economy, like all the, go ahead. Well, fair enough. I'm being, I'm being a, a bit of a iconoclastic, but, uh, but, but what about, what about the notion of free transit? What about the notion of actually, like my mother is 94, she's still alive, lives by herself. She has to stand there as the bus goes by full. She can't get on the bus. She stands there for an hour waiting for a bus as they go by full. And we're and we're fussing about a, a about a carbon tax. You know, we we even even the SkyTrain, you know, we're building this density down down Broadway. Is SkyTrain gonna have enough density to carry that volume? It's, it's not a subway, it's a light rail system that's not designed for that kind of density. So there's no, there's, where's the government intervention to actually make a difference on carbon rather than just, you know, 10 cents a gallon or whatever it is, a liter tax on, 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 on gas. Like, I don't, that, that's, I just think it's a, it's a false debate. It's a debate that's great for Pierre Puglia. It's great for, for people. It's a, it's a debate that, man, let's debate the tax instead of debating the problem of global warming and how we're going to fix it and how we're going to deal with it. And, you know, I, I, I still don't, and, and this includes, the NDP's done a lot in terms of clean energy, but, you know, I look at that site C and think, man, like we need a lot more of those. <laughs> and I don't, you know, in, in other yeah, parts- Yeah, that was hard to get through. Yeah. Hard to get through, really hard to get through. Yeah. And very difficult yeah. internal debate for the NDP. Now, uh, environmentalists, I guess, argue that that we should be doing more on the conservation side and we probably and and, the, and certainly a very good point there i mean even on conservation you know when i was there we had it we we had a little 
program with BC Hydro and Conservation. But I mean, that's not even that's not escalated. You know, my son lives in Chilliwack in a house. It's got single pane windows. Lots of houses in BC with single pane windows. And, uh, you know, people people sitting in their fancy buildings in Victoria, maybe, <laughs> or in Ottawa, don't they don't realize that that people people live in places that, that need retrofitting, a lot of retrofitting for saving. People in Atlantic Canada complain about oil prices. And I think there's a lot of people in BC who thought, oh, people still are on oil and they're heating their home. Yeah, lots of people. <laughs> well, let me let's talk a bit more about regulation. You've you've talked about a little bit about housing, and it's a good it's a good point. I mean, you shared with me many times your view, which I don't quarrel with really, that <laughs> the real political power in our system lies at the provincial level. So municipal right. politicians are dealing with delegated powers, federal politicians have got international stuff that fundamentally most people don't care about. But we see now provincially the province stepping in very hard on the housing file, mm -hmm. which you've shown a lot of interest in as well. Uh, to tell municipalities how to run the show, what they should have as minimum standards or maximum standards and that kind of thing. Um, and it's not a taxation approach. Do you think it will be effective? Do you feel that uh, there needs to be a lot more government intervention on a number of fronts to make headway on some of the problems we face? Yeah, the latter. I mean, I think I think the challenge I have is I have a, I don't know if anybody knows this, probably listening, to, I have a master's degree in community and regional planning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was in graduate school, People were coming from all around the world to look at Vancouver's model of planning, community-based planning. And so I don't like the idea that we're going to throw that out <laughs> at the holy grail of building more, because I think supply mm -hmm. is only part of the solution to the problem. So I, I'm kind of a planner at heart. I prefer to see uh, neighborhoods planned density and carefully managed density and think about the consequences of it, the parks and the recreation facilities and the transit and the electrification and all the things you need to do to, to put. So I, mm. I do worry that, that it's a bit ham-fisted, some of the approach to the province. I get it because people are housing so, so, so in short supply. But I would prefer to see some government housing. You know, um, one of the problems, of course, this is, again, back to Mike McDonald's government that kind of destroyed the social <laughs> the SRO system. Remember, do you remember that that, that was that that was Mike's government? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Mike. We destroyed oh. the SROs. Yeah, remember most of those remember those I think most, well I think Rich Rich Coleman bought a lot of SROs. Most yeah. of them used to be run by the government used to run social housing. It was contracted out to save money by the Christy Clark Campbell government that you were part of. So all that contracting out that took place uh, has 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 meant that government is doesn't actually run any housing anymore. They they don't they literally don't. They, it's everything's basically private privatized. To, 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 oh, I see. You're saying uh, nonprofits are uh, yeah nonprofits running the government housing. Yeah, and so and they and you don't like they that enough money, and they don't and they don't have enough money, and mm -hmm. they don't have enough resources, and they may well be right, uh, but it's, it's there's no. The government sort of got out of housing uh, under your government, Mike. Government got out of housing. You're giving, you're giving me a lot of credit here. No. Yeah, well, you're, you're architect. <laughs> the Mike you government. government. Yeah, so they got out of housing, and now you're trying to. Now they haven't got. Now to try to deal with the crisis, you know, they're 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 pushing hard at the private sector and nonprofits to get to get back in. And so I get it, but I would like to see some more actual actual provincial government. Housing, building housing, <laughs> like get back in the housing business. So you want to see BBC housing running its own housing? Yeah, and building housing. Because it's not, certainly funding want, a lot of housing. Obviously, developers are hugely important in the process. It's yeah. not a it's not a one, you need to do all of the above, actually. I just would like to see some initiative to actually bring back uh, BC housing. And you know, the Barrett government had Dunhill development and we didn't do very much when I was there. It's true, we did some. Uh, the federal government, uh, the liberals, uh, again, Mike, the federal liberals got out of housing. Uh, uh, you weren't part of that, I guess, but supported them, but you weren't part of that. Well, you but just blame me for everything. But, it's but okay. they destroyed. <laughs> it works. We all, it's, that's what we do. It's 100% liberal federal government destroyed the housing system for 20, 30 years, right? So there's a whole gap in housing built by the federal government when we were government, there was no joint federal, no federal funds. So we built some housing when we were there, which is one of the only governments in Canada to do so, but clearly not enough. And we could, we were hamstrung because of the federal government abandoning the housing 
field uh, completely. And so, you know, it's just caught up to us. You can't bring in a million people a year in immigration or half a million people, and this year a million, and every year building all these people. Think about British Columbia. 50,000 people a year come to British Columbia. So roughly the size of New Westminster is added to the population of the Lower Mainland every year for the last 20 or 30 years. Now it's higher today. It's I think it's 100,000, maybe 200,000 in the coming to Vancouver. So, and then the government stopped building housing and the market of course has failed because it doesn't, 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 that doesn't, uh, discriminate it goes to where it get the most return as it should the market that's the that's the job of the market of the market economy mm. of the of the private sector so they go where they can get the most money and it's not been enough to satisfy the this huge gap in in housing with with poor and middle income people and so that's where the government has to play a role and and, and i applaud the provincial government for trying they're, they're doing an enormous effort to make changes i'm not sure It'll work because I think um, fighting with the municipalities is not easy or fun or often productive. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I resemble that remark for sure. So, um, <laughs> so in that respect, uh, I, think, um, I think it's going to be challenging because I think municipalities will, will not tolerate, most municipalities won't and probably shouldn't tolerate, um, you know, abandoning their folks, their people, uh, in any kind of planning process. So I think it, uh, but in notion, notionally, it's good. It drive, it'll drive change and that's good. It'll drive more development, I think. And that's good. Some, by the way, the federal liberal government has also been uh, very good on this. I mean, they're really starting, I give, I trying to be an equal opportunity, uh, you know, plot it's here. The federal, the federal government, uh, has done a lot on housing recently, tried to, and I think, and I think we'll do more. So that there's some there's some positive aspects, but 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 this pent up demand and this challenge is really a problem, I, and I don't. It's going to be very hard to fix. So the EV government is kind of taking a different tack with municipalities and being more interventionist. Yeah. And uh, the pendulum has swung towards provincial uh, direct action compared to maybe where it was in the past. Do you think Vancouver needs to be a mega city like Toronto? Do you think that would help, or do you have any reflections on? How our municipalities are organized? You no, know, that's a really good question, Mike. You know, I kind of vacillate back and forth on this topic. When I was there, we did. You know, there's some lot. I, you know, what I'd say probably no, but that's maybe just my bias. You know, the bigger entities um, really are less responsive, right? But it, you know, it's you can argue there's certainly cost savings to do so. You take like New Westminster and Burnaby. Could that function more efficiently if they were in one one city instead of two? I think the answer is clearly yes. But you know, I give you a North small, Vancouver and North Vancouver. Yeah, I, but I give Langley. you a small Langley anecdote. and Langley. I give you a small anecdote, Mike. That you know is interesting. When I was responsible for TransLink, uh, I uh, wanted to bring uh, real police officers. I did not want to have a transit police. Uh, that was done by uh, your government, Mike. Uh, I didn't really like transit police because transit police uh, would go on the transit system and if there was a problem, they would phone the real police. And so I wanted to have real police officers at every station. So I met with the mayor of, uh, sorry, I met with the uh, mayor. I met, I met with the mayor, but I also met with the police chief in, Van in Vancouver when I was premier. And I said, or no, when, when I was a minister, and I said, I'd like to put uh, Vancouver City Police at every station. And we'll pay for it. And he said no. And I said I couldn't believe he'd say, turn it down. He say, well, he said because if there's a a, a murder in downtown Vancouver, we want we're going to deploy the police to that murder scene, and they're not going to be standing around a sky train station. And I said, well, if I'm paying, meaning the province is paying for policing at the sky train station, they have to be at the sky train station or in that vicinity of the sky train station. And he turned down uh, free money from the province to do that. And so we didn't get uh, real police officers. And then a subsequent government decided they would have transit police who, I don't know how effective they are, but there's lots of them now and we spent a lot of money on it. And uh, I just kind of like the idea of integrating it. But I, I use that little anecdote because this is the problem with amalgamation. If you amalgamate, say, police services in the lower mainland, you save a lot of money, mm. but they're going to go where the where the police think the problems are. And right now, when you have 
if say West Van, for example, may not have the same level of problems as downtown East Side, but they control their own police force and they dedicate it the way they wish and they use them for whatever services they want. And so I think it's always that debate between efficiency and kind of accountability. And I always try to lean towards accountability more than efficiency. And that's why I kind of like local autonomy and local support and local control of those resources, even at the expense, to, uh, uh, even if it's slightly more expensive in terms of the overall. Although, you know, fundamentally, I'm not sure it'd be more expensive because these big entities tend to consume a lot of money and they tend to have a kind of a, a self-perpetuating uh, cycle. And so I don't know if you didn't save money anyway. Yeah, no, I was going to say like, I think, and I'm sure someone, I'm sure there are folks out there who would argue me on this, but if you wanted to take Toronto's amalgamation as a yeah. case study, yeah. uh, wondering if you know, maybe know Barbara Hall too, yeah. from her time out here and planning, but um, if you want to take that as a case study, I think you would, I, I think it'd be fair at a high level to say cost savings achieved politically uh, it was a mess and the council eventually became untenable. Um, and too uh, big. Yeah, too big, too big. And the, um, yeah, and uh, that's a, that's a PhD dissertation, but yeah, it, it didn't function very well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm mindful. Um, there's, there's a question I really want to get to. Um, <laughs> and it, it's actually, honestly, it's, I want to ask you about scandal. I sure. want to ask you about scandal because we had uh, Keith Baldry on last week and he was sort of reflecting on, Casino Gate and and had an ass assessment from his standpoint that that was that was pretty overblown. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering, you know, when you look back on that in hindsight, sort of what you see, and generally, I think what you see about how we understand and what we constitute a scandal these days. Yeah, a different time, right? Remember, we used to have a press gallery. There's no press gallery now. We used to have a media. There's no media now. No, no offense. There's podcasts which are excellent, but there's no broad. There's no there's no broad dominant media structure like there was when I was there, and so uh, so anything can get blown up, particularly as um, particularly if the government's unpopular or there's issues, you know, or or the establishment uh, is opposed to that person, uh, right or left. You saw it with Bill Van Der Zamp too. You know, there's huge intense focus. It's harder to do now. I think it's it's, it's better to be in, uh, incumbent now. I think in government generally because you don't have the same level of scrutiny that, I mean, each, each year goes by, there seems to be less dominant media. It doesn't, I mean, there's obviously issues. So I don't know. Can, they, I, can I, can I interrupt and say, yeah. cause I'm feeling itchy. I'm just, I'm feeling itchy. And I just want to say uh, on behalf of, you know, Hotel Pacifico, we do not see ourselves replacing the diminishing right. press gallery at all. And we stand arm to arm with them and lamenting their no, decline, just no, to put that no, on the record. Yeah, yeah. No, totally, Kate, I get that. And, I, and I'm not saying you do. I, I'm just saying that I'm just saying that it's a disaggregated model of media consumption now that makes it harder for mm. big themes, you know, and uh, it means it does kind of lead to that dumbing down of politics a little bit that I kind of talked about earlier, where where you know people are doing TikToks and and this kind of stuff to try to, but in, in defense of the politicians trying to get their message out in a difficult environment. It used to be you just got on BCTV News and you were you just dominated the newscast, good or bad, <laughs> and I've done both. Um, but now it, it's it's much more difficult. So it's a really good question. The scandal thing. It's such a different time because the flip side of of the big scandal that. You know the stuff that I had to deal with on, is is that um, uh, stuff can I mean it, it's so viral now right like mm. it, it's so intense the focus on on people and and how they react and it, and it, and the level of of sort of vitriol and is just horrible you know like you know I I'm the last person to support Pierre Trudeau he'd probably be the last person I'd vote for. But this notion of, you know, F Trudeau and stuff that you see everywhere. I, I saw a guy with a car. He had all his signs saying F Trudeau, big signs on it. And so to I be said, clear, we're talking about Justin, not Pierre. Yeah, Justin. Yeah. Just recently. And I said to the yeah. guy, I said, yeah, I, I don't really like Justin Trudeau either. I said, but do you think that's going to persuade people to vote against him? You know, this foul language, like plastered all over your car, right? So I only use this. If I'm... I'm segueing a little bit from scandal. It's just that there's a, what's a scandal now, right? If people um, don't like you, you know, they sort of, 
it, they th they say there's a scandal. Like, I don't know, you know, my rights are being violated. Uh, and, you know, or this is what people are saying, like the federal government is a scandalous government. They're violating people's rights. And I look at it and think, what what are they talking about? I'm so so divorced from from my perception. And and this is from someone who obviously doesn't support the current federal government. But it's the intense um, the intent the, the escalation of issues to sort of pseudo scandals that I think is a big problem for politicians today. I don't know if that so, answers your question, Kate. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> No, it's interesting. And well, I mean, I'm to build on it a bit. I'm like, like, can you imagine? Do you ever think back to sort of some of the scandals you know you faced in your time and think like, God, what would that have looked like if people were discussing it on Twitter? Yeah, no, you're right. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. That um, but then again, would it have yeah, it wouldn't, I don't know today whether you'd have the same level of um, yeah. you know, this mass media change, the like people's consumption habits have changed so much. That I mean, I personally rarely watch the news now, and it's not because I don't want to watch the news or interested in the news, but and I rarely watch cable television. I'm watching, you know, Netflix or Apple or something, you know, if I'm watching TV at all. So it, you know, you're consuming your news through digital, you know, subscriptions and stuff, and and podcasts. Frankly, that's that's probably how I consume news more, um, and that just doesn't lend itself to the big brush. Um, campaign it must be so hard to campaign now too again because you used to campaign as you know you guys know better than i do you campaign with a dedicated you know with a bus a tour and media following and yeah. all kinds of media attention and leading the news and you're always trying to you know manufacture if you will your story and get it out there and uh now i don't know is, this, is there any media traveling on the bus anymore is there no. anybody tours are dead tours are dead yeah so tours are yeah. dead so so, and tours were, were everything, right? That's how you connected with people. That's yeah. how you got into communities. You had rallies. You well, tele television was everything. Television was everything. And now, and now it's not. I mean, well, it's, video it's video is everything, but video huh? is can, video yeah. can be done anywhere now. Yeah. I mean, it's on I your phone. That make, right? Does it make it easier to campaign in some ways? I mean, you just... Well, I you know, I, I look back to 2017 uh, when Horgan just stayed put in the lower mainland and just... You know, they got the message out by going yeah. five kilometers a day. It didn't really matter that they had to get on an airplane. And yeah. it's all just a, to the, about the narrative, right? Yeah, it's probably um, does also it matter? easier because when you go out and, you know, when you're campaigning in a more traditional sense, you are always running into, as Christy did, for example, that one experience with her where you run into hostile yeah. people, right? Just because you're in the world, yeah. you're in the real world. And um and of course, those any hostile encounter is fodder for the television networks. Yeah. Uh, even if you if you saw if you saw if you spoke to a thousand people and there were rapturous applause and they loved you and yeah. they're standing ovation and and they interviewed twenty people on the street and nineteen of them were positive and one was vitriolically negative. That's the one they play, right? And so now uh, politicians yeah. stay in this little bubble, right? And they produce their narrative, and they make sure there's no. Um, you know, well, I, that's the danger, and then you look very inauthentic. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Or you, I think you go I, the other way. You got Polyev, right? polyev has yeah. got yeah. gets these huge crowds, and he just he embraces that, right? Yeah, and that's a, that's Actually, another way to go. He's been uh, he he's getting terrific crowds. I mean, I I haven't yeah. seen this in a long, long time, maybe ever. Yeah, right? uh, of of uh, working people. Absolutely, yeah. he is. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And that uh, speaks and he's and he's going speaks to, to where we started. Yeah, he's going to um, he's going to places uh, that it surprises me actually. You know, he's going into towns and getting two, three thousand people yeah. out. And I mean, maybe I'm just yeah. old, but I remember you know you get two thousand people out. That is hard. That's not easy to get two thousand. Well, people he, out. he yeah, like he went up to Campbell River and got a huge crowd, and it, right. you know, I think they're eyeing some of those. Uh, yeah, he went to Vancouver Penticton. Island Riding that have always voted. They're protest voters, to, right? They he went to Penticton and got a couple thousand people recently yeah. and that's so i mean well. going back to where you started in this interview you talked about class and that's yeah. how you i think would stoked your fires in politics sure. when you got in yeah. and really it's there's different dimensions now yeah. it's there's a climate access yeah. there's a i would argue an identity access identity politics so class is um 
not the be all end all now for uh, progressive parties. You're it right. seems you're correct. Yeah. And, and know, that, that's issues, where I, that well, these, realignment's happening. Yeah, I agree with you. And the, these issues though, have always been uh, there on the progressive side. There's always been issues on gender and on, on, mm -hmm. on human rights and other, other issues. So they've always been important issues. And, you know, but any, no, as you know, uh, Mike and Kate, I guess all, Parties are not monolithic, right? Mm -hmm. And there, there really are coalitions, right, of of groups, yeah. right? So inside, if you're going to represent forty percent of the vote, they have to be, yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. There, yeah. And so, so what happens is, uh, it really depends on you know which part of the coalition is in the ascendancy at any given time. Yeah. The Liberal Party is a good example of that, right? And I again don't say this in any uh, uh, pejorative way. Um, you know, they might have a, a fairly conservative. Uh, you know, prime minister at some point, and they might have a fairly progressive prime minister at other points inside, depending on that what faction inside that party is dominant at any given time. And the same is true for the NDP. I just said that from my motivation, I come from that more working class, looking at the lens of politics through the through economic justice more than anything else, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. But that's not to say there are lots of people in the NDP who who come to politics. For different motive, different reasons, different motivations, whether it's environmental issues or it's um, uh, different, you know, uh, you're right, uh, different intersectionality issues. You know, it's a it's a different, yeah. uh, I, a different time. I, I would the, even argue, I would even argue that the success of the BC NDP compared to other provinces has a lot to do with the size of the tent of the NDP yeah. in this province compared to other provinces. I agree with that. I think that's true. And I, I think, and I think John Horgan did a lot to really help that, right? Because I think he really had a nice way uh, about him, right? Of not a, a, mm -hmm. a very a genuine um, um, way of, the way he talked, you know, his, he was very inclusive in the way he talked, even, even if it wasn't uh, always in his, his policies, right? But his, he was very a uh, broad, uh, brush, non-threatening, if you will, uh, progressive leader. Well, I think that's actually, I mean, interestingly, that's, um, I would, it, one of my observations of John Horgan is how much he has in common with Doug Ford, actually. Yeah. Because they're, it, Doug Ford and both of them have this ability when they're disagreeing with you to yeah. be kind of non-threatening. Yeah. They, this kind of like, yeah, well, we're all reasonable people. Like, let's, yeah. let's have a chat uh, way of delivering a message that I think is very powerful. Although I think Doug Ford is John Horgan without the charm. Yeah, yeah, they're not. I'm not equating the two, but there's yeah. an interesting. Yeah, completely yeah. agreed. Yeah, yeah. I think well, they, both of them, and and this was a this is a virtue in politics, which is rare, rare. They they can climb down, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Oh, I I thought I was right, but you guys are convinced me I'm wrong, and change direction. And that's that's a that's a rare. It's and it's rare to get away with that actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they climb down and, and do they, it. You know? Yeah, they climb down and the the authentic they can they can bring an authenticity to it that most yeah. people will be flip flop it'll be whatever they yeah, exactly. can land exactly yep. both of them have got away have made changes and not been accused of flip flopping which is usually the 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 attack no you're right and uh, but anyway he's done a lot for for the party I think EB uh, EB comes to the NDP not from the party right he's not really an NDP or yeah. will born and raised comes from a, a, a more middle-class family in Ontario Grew up in Ontario. Yeah. And, and he came, and he came to the NDP. We talked about me being interested in sort of working class issues. He came to the NDP um, through uh pivot and through his human rights uh, activities, right. Through his, through his, through his civil liberties and, and legal background, which is obviously uh, ter been terrific and, uh, but a different, just a different perspective. But he seems to be metamorphosizing as he goes and, yeah, I mean that as a compliment in terms of uh, you know uh, changing no, his agree. view on a few things. I agree. I heard him speak yeah. the other day. I thought he was terrific. I mean, he's. I think he's come. A, I think he's really improved his game. You know, just generally, and I think that's not surprising, right? He's a really smart guy, yeah. and, and let's say he's he's attorney general and he's focused on his area and he's active and he's doing yeah. his thing. Suddenly, when you're the premier, it's different, right? You gotta you gotta look at everything, and you gotta look at a much broader coalition, and you gotta be up to speed on lots of different issues and he's um so i think he's just naturally broadened as he's learned the ropes yeah. of the job uh our listeners may have wondered where jeff was the last 10 minutes uh <laughs> we seem to have an infrastructure deficit and uh, uh, 
South Falls Creek area. Are you on Rogers? And, uh, <laughs> oh, oh uh, it's uh, well, aren't they the only one now? Um, we, uh, yeah, my, my, we are sponsored crashed. by Telus. I may add, oh, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> I apologize for my sudden departure. It wasn't anything you said. <laughs> well, we're just, uh, and we we're just in the wrap up here, but, uh, Jeff, maybe we should give you the last question. Uh, well, I would hate to repeat something that's already been said, but I, I, um, you've talked a bit about Kevin Falcon, I take it. No, I haven't. Uh, no, not yet. You haven't. Well, what advice would you give him uh, as he tries to wrestle with his problems on the right flank, or would you tell him to throw in the towel? Boy, that's a really interesting question, and it's fascinating to watch what's happening here. Um, I guess I, he, it's funny because I would have probably said he was doing everything right until the uh, the rise of the conservatives. In other words, you know, he really felt, I think, and I would have believed this, that you know, he he could take for granted that extreme right wing uh, group and he needed to broaden and win some of the suburbs by being more moderate, which is clearly what he's been trying to do, uh, whether he believes it or not. That's another question, but he, he certainly was working that way. And so to get attacked that side is really a problem for him. And um, and obviously, Pierre Pouliev's uh, popularity is all, is having a huge impact on the provincial conservative party and the name recognition. So. Um, He's in a real conundrum. I I I don't know. I worry if I were him, I'd worry about the momentum the conservatives have because um, they've done a very good job of exploiting some, I think, minority issues. Right? Well, you know, if you take this is an interesting. Piers uh, Pilyev has also done this, which is also kind of impressive in a weird way that maybe a horrible way, but you know, like the anti-vax issue is such a small issue in Canada, relatively speaking, you know, maybe it's 10%, maybe, maybe, I don't know, you guys know better than I do, maybe it's 20% of the population, but it's a tiny minority position uh, in Canada. And so to support that view, you'd think would be fatal politically. But instead, what's happened is that group has given a base of support, which is rock solid for conservatives now provincially and federally, I think, the same with the anti-Soji crowd and all of the other issues that they seem to be exploiting, which I think, I think, and I kind of hope means they, they wouldn't form the government, but they could form a very big block in opposition, at least this next time around. And they could easily pass, I think, the United Party if they're not careful. You know, I, in, in business, I was involved in rebranding a couple of companies in a minor way. And just to watch how expensive it is to rebrand, how challenging it is marketing wise, and just all the things you have to do when you change the the brand of the company. Uh, and so I think they just underestimated the challenge without the resources, without the mass media we just talked about, without the ability to sort of rebrand in a in a in a dramatic way. They were just kind of hoping, I think, that they could get through to the election, then people would focus on the on the debate just in that 30 days, and there'd only be two parties, and, and they would naturally polarize, and they would have a good chance of winning, just, you know, I thought was a reasonable proposition. But now I think uh, they're in a real conundrum, because I don't think it would be genuine for the for the United Party to sort of try to co-opt some of those extreme right-wing positions. Is it, is it a problem for David Eby, you know? or should he just go home and have a second <laughs> eggnog? Well, it's, it's only a problem for David Eby and the NDP because they have some uh, vulnerabilities right now of having been in office for a while and some challenges out there that people aren't happy with. They're working really hard on it, whether it's health care or, or housing or crime and disorder and those issues that, you know, they're working hard on them. But they're, they, they still have some, some you know, some I think there's some concern about out in the public about those, particularly, say, those those three issues. And so anytime you're, you know, you're, you're not popular on those core issues, you should be running hard and try and running scared. Uh, uh, but on balance, I think it's very good news for the NDP because um, uh, it's a split on the, on the right. And when, uh, you, when you came to the leadership in February, 96, mm -hmm. uh, you had a hanging in a fortnight if you didn't turn it around and yeah. you obviously unleashed a blizzard of, uh, Yep. announcements, announcement a day, you dominated the uh, news agenda and put yourself in a position of strength by the time the rip period was called. Mm -hmm. And I assume the pressure was on and you were able to rally the troops and uh, get everyone whipped into shape uh, because of fear, I guess, of losing. 
Um, but, you know, with the EB government, it's the reverse, you know, where if there's any concern I would have is just that everyone's going to think it's too easy uh, heading Maybe. into election year. Yeah. Yeah. I, we were 26 points behind at one point when I took over. So I remember that does, does concentrate the mind a little bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and of course it does, it gave me um, a bit more carte blanche to do stuff because we were behind yeah. and do it. Whereas you're right. They, they've got a challenge, but you know, it's, it's never, you know, it's always just, uh, you know, you don't have to be great just to be better than the other guy. Yeah. And uh, clearly the, this current provincial government is a lot better than the other alternatives. So I think they're in pretty good shape. On that inspiring note, gentlemen, I'm going to call it. <laughs> I think <clears throat> former Premier, Premier Glenn Clark, I think we could keep you here all day. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I think it was just such a pleasure to have you. Thanks for taking us kind of back in history to the, you know, conjecture in the present. It was a pleasure. Anytime I get to poke around Mike McDonald, I'm happy to do so. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. Look forward to returning the favor sometime. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot lately, guests, about the things we do less of since the pandemic. Things like paying with cash or ordering off a hard copy menu, sharing a cheese fondue with strangers, coughing in public without feeling the need to share a disclaimer that it's just allergies, sending a meeting invite without a Zoom or Teams link, or seeing a movie in an actual theater. Barbenheimer notwithstanding. Unfortunately, another thing we're doing less of is volunteering. According to Volunteer Canada, 65% of organizations who rely on volunteers are struggling to find them, and 35% are reducing services because of it. Volunteering is an important way to give back, and presenting sponsor TELUS knows this well. Volunteering over 2.2 million days since 2000. That's what informs their signature global volunteer movement, TELUS Days of Giving, also known as TDOC. Not the character from the TV series, The Walking Dead T-Dog? Tell us days of giving T-Dog. The one that since its inception over 20 years ago has engaged and enabled over half a million volunteers to give back to their communities, including a record-breaking year last year that made 2023 the most giving year on record for TELUS team members, retirees, family, and friends. TELUS remains the global leader in social capitalism with 23 years of consistent strategic execution, an unparalleled legacy of giving. Yes, I hope your holidays are filled with giving. I hope you're healthy and safe. And if you do share a cheese fondue, it's only with the people you want to share it with. Thank you for listening from Hotel Pacifico and all the Tellus family. Happy holidays. Let's raise a glass or take a shot. Time to raid the mini bar. Okay, we're at the mini bar for the end of the year. Love a good end of year celebration. Let's wrap it up, Mike and Jeff, I think, with uh, who we want to raise a glass to to round out 2023. Well, I, I need to start. Oh, you're, you're going to start? Because I need yeah. a drink. No. I actually need a drink. <laughs> okay, go for it. Yeah. After that interview with Glenn Clark. A lot of, uh, a lot of triggered a lot of bad memories, eh? I mean, you can even the stand the devastation you, you left the province in. You, 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 uh, yeah. you ducked out of the interview for 10 minutes because you couldn't. You're, you're, you're like, I don't need a beer. Felt I'm uncomfortable me being I personally know. attacked. <laughs> I, I uh, didn't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> it was a because fun my, interview. My bad. But crashed. I'm going to take a shot at Glenn Clark. Um, just because I think he would not expect otherwise. Uh, that interview was less than two and a half sword lengths away. Um, I felt. But uh, I greatly enjoyed it. Uh, I'm still going to take a shot at him, though, because that's what you do in BC politics um, when you're on a different side. But. Uh, I also want to raise a glass as well. Uh, we're here at the end of the year. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about who who are the people that made a big impact on, on BC politics this year, and you know who are who is you know really the the been the performers of the year. And I I think it's kind of undeniable to me that you gotta I gotta have to raise a glass to the premier because he, he went pillar to post this year, uh, taking on the leadership about a year ago. The premiership and a year later he is still in a strong position as premier and the opposition is fragmented in the last year out of circumstance not necessarily the ndp's doing but they didn't get in the way of it so i'll raise a glass to the premier because you know what you're sitting here pretty uh, a year later after you started and there's election in nine months you know a week's a lifetime of politics 2024 could be a different story but looking back um, I think he deserves a glass. There you go. Pass up, Mike McDonald. 
Well, I'm going to raise my glass to uh, to Mayor Ken Sim of Vancouver because he took a highly questionable move repudiating an election commitment to keep the park board, to, just issued an edict to end the park board and then handed the entire can of worms to Premier David Eby to work out through some adjudication of a transition plan. And uh, I think this is gonna be a headache for a lot of the NDP MLAs in Vancouver who are gonna hear from a lot of people who care about the park board. And if they wanna to talk to the uh, council about it, the council can say, well, you should raise your issues with the province because it's over to them. So <laughs> I don't wanna talk about the Vancouver Park Board just to say, uh, good work, Mayor Ken Sim. You've, you've taken a problem that I'm not sure you had and handed it to Premier David Eby, who has, uh, as Mike says, has shown himself adept at managing a lot of these problems. So there you go. Nice. Um, so my, my glass has a bit of a preamble. And it relates to the fact that I was missing last week because I was in jury duty. Uh, and all last week I was in the trial, hearing the trial, and then I was in deliberations from early Friday morning until late Saturday night. And I am wow. exhausted. And I have to say, when I got some, when I got my summons, I, my reaction was like, this is the last thing I need right now. I've got podcasts on the go, full-time job, couple of kids, like just was not like leaping up to do this. And I went in, it would have been a week ago on Thursday, I went in for the actual summons where they sort of, they bring a hundred, hundred of you into the room and they call numbers up and then you stand in front of the judge and you say whether you can, whether you can, um, whether you can be a juror on this case. And I watched people crank through and I would say close to four out of five said no. The excuses ranged from, um, I don't believe in jail. I think it's a construct. Uh, and to, I believe I may be allergic to cr criminal trials. So by the time I'd heard a few of these, I was pretty motivated. I was pretty like, you know what? I think I think I need to show up for this. I think this is important. And I don't believe in giving silly excuses for something like this. And I can't say much about the deliberations. Um, I can say that I was in for, um, I was a juror uh, and the four person uh, on the jury for a sexual assault case. Um, and that it was, it was a hard case to hear and it was a hard case to decide. And I have so much respect for the other 11 people that I was literally locked in a room with for two days. And I can say at the end of that process that every person in that room mattered. And this is me raising my glass to our listeners because I I've talked with so many of you, I think all but all of us had, and you get this feedback and you, you know, it's this beautiful kind of world of people of all political stripes and ages and demographics and backgrounds who care for whatever reason and take the time every week to listen and learn a bit more about BC politics. And I raise a glass to our listeners because I know politicos, you know better than most, how important it is to have your say. The impact of removing your voice from any pillar of our democracy is devastating. And I raise a glass to you and say, when you get that summons, it's okay to be like, shit, I really don't need this. And please show up. Please show up because it really, really matters. So cheers to all of you. Cheers. Well said. That's a wrap for the 2023 season of Hotel Pacifico. Thanks to presenting sponsor TELUS, and thanks everyone for listening. It's not a pillow mint, we're still working on those, but as a little holiday thank you, we're extending an offer from TELUS. When you use our exclusive code DCC6292, you can call 1-877-274-6408 and receive access to the most exclusive discounts and offers to all participating TELUS and Kudo products not seen anywhere else online or in person. In case you missed the code or number, you can always look in the show notes. Happy holidays from all of us at Hotel Pacifico. Book your dates for 2024. We'll see you soon. Check out time at Hotel Pacifico. We hope you enjoyed your stay.